alive. <clears throat> it's, it's Groundhog's Day, and I never know whether Punxsutawney Phil saw his shadow or not, um, whether we're going to have more winter or not. I don't think it really matters what, what the groundhog says. We're going to have it or we're not. Um, so, but I'm in Huntsville, Alabama, and we're having a pretty beautiful day today. The sun is out and it might hit 60. Uh, when we finish here today, I'll go out on my big power walk and uh, don't have to be quite as bundled up as I have to be when it's 40. So um, anyway, but uh, I'm glad to see you all. Uh, last month was a not so live and next month also will be a not so live. I will be teaching at Empty Schools um, Seminar in Asilomar, at the, the conference center in Asilomar. I'm very excited about this job. I'll be teaching Wendy Williams pattern full circle. And the class is full. I've got 20 some people that are going to spend five and a half days with me working on this great quilt. So I'm very excited about that. So I will on uh, the next, uh, this weekend, I'll record the next um, segment that's going to air on Friday, March the 1st. Um, I, I have so much that I want to share with you today that I really just need to jump right into this. Um, so I know people are coming on, and uh, but I, I, I've got to get started. So uh, you can always, you know, this will record and you can watch it again um, very quickly. It only takes a couple of minutes for it to show back up as a recorded um, video afterwards. And you can always watch them um, later. But the um, we have a good problem. You, the t acrylic templates. I am getting tons of questions and emails and phone calls from people saying, oh, where are they? So the um, Alex says it's all my fault. I told you all. I told her before she even made the public announcement, everybody's going to want these templates. So um, the, the, what you don't understand maybe is that the Quilt Show is really a small company and small companies struggle with inventory. But they can't order 5,000 of something and hope that they sell. They have to try to gauge what the interest level is going to be. So uh, in early November, when the reveal, the big reveal of our wonderful pattern, um, Jen Kingwell's pattern, Pick a Petal, came out, um, the, the sales of the templates were fine, but they weren't overwhelming. They weren't speedy. It took several weeks for the, the order to sell, to sell out. So they said, well, we better get some more. And so they did. They got a second order. Now, these are manufactured in Australia, and it's a, takes a, it's a slow boat for them to get here. It takes a, a while for the manufacture and the shipping of this particular product, the template sets. So, uh, again, the second order came in. And, again, they didn't sell out overnight. They, you know, just kind of, you know, over November, December, you know, it was, a, it was good. Well, then January starts and we have the pattern and, oh my gosh, everybody wants the templates. So they order more. And those finally came in. They got to the store this Wednesday, uh, two days ago. And I've been checking on them to try to, because I'm getting all these questions. So I found out um, about dinner time, my time on Wednesday, that they were back in the store. And all those people who had asked to be notified got the notification. Within hours, they were sold out. And clearly, there was still a demand for more. So there is a solution, and it is a, a time-sensitive solution, and you need to act very, very quickly. A, an email is going out. It probably is going out right now, even as we speak. You may have already received it. If you want the templates, one more order is going to be placed on Monday. So you have the email will have a direct link to the store. You will be pre ordering the templates if you want them. You will buy them. You'll pay for them now. This has to happen before Monday, February the 5th at noon Eastern time. I would say do it through the weekend. Consider you've got today, Friday, you have Saturday and Sunday to place your order. However many are ordered in this pre-order and paid for, because that's what you have to do as you're, you are prepaying for these, that's how many will be ordered. And they are prepared to order those. And, and the company that manufactures them is prepared to get the number on Monday and jump on these immediately and get them made. It will likely be March when they arrive because of the time it takes, of course, to manufacture and ship and get them to California. And then they turn around and ship them out to you. If you want the templates, this is your last opportunity for in all of 2024 to get them. So if you want them, you need to plan on, look for that email and go ahead and order. It's going out to everyone who was on the notification list and all-star members. That's a lot of people. 
if you want these templates, you have to order them this weekend. I just, if we were in person to person, in face to face, I'd have, have you all repeat that, okay? This weekend. So be looking for that. Um, now, uh, I just want to mention one other aspect of this. You can't, they don't want you to order anything else with this pre order except those templates. So don't add on additional things that you're looking for. Do that as a separate order. I would also encourage you, if you have any interest at all in the kit, in ordering the kit, the kit is a beautiful set of fabrics. I'm enjoying working with them. You can see them there behind. This is the kit. A lot of it. I put in a few of my own favorite things, too, and some leftovers. There are some of those left, a few. There are not many. So uh, those will never be available again. So it's a even if you don't want to do this quilt, it's a great kit of really beautiful fabrics. Have All those neutrals, I've made my log cabin blocks, as you can see up there behind me. It might be even hard to see them. And those neutrals are really pretty interesting neutrals. So anyway, uh, I would encourage you to do that, but do not add it on. You, you don't want to add anything to the pre-order of templates, but the pre-orders, okay? So it's a good problem to have. We are thrilled that you love this quilt as much as we knew you would. I'm thrilled that you know that the templates are really helpful because I thought so. But you don't have to wait. I've seen several people write on the forum and I can feel the frustration that I can't start until I get the templates. No, that isn't true at all. You can start. And so well, the first thing I want to talk about right now is a show on the quilt show that I think every one of you should watch. And it shows 1602 with Sally Collins. Sally Collins no longer travels to teach. I learned more from her about piecing than anybody, uh, all the classes I've ever taken. And that's saying a lot because I have taken a lot of classes from the top people. She was also the most prepared teacher I have ever seen. She taught me what a good teacher does and how you prepare and how you make sure that you have all your ducks in a row. She was great. You can watch that show. It shows 1602. The first 23 minutes, she demonstrates how she makes templates for machine piecing. They can also be used for hand piecing. They're, they have the little hole in the dots, just like these acrylic um, templates do. She talks about using a 16th of an inch hole punch. The smallest one that I found uh, years ago, I've had this for years, is an eighth of an inch hole punch. That's really a little bit too big hole, but you can still find sixteenths of an inch hole punches probably at like a scrapbooking store. A workaround for that, if you don't have a tiny hole punch, I use the eighth and I'm going to show you what size it is in a few minutes when we get it back into, when I go to the document camera. But another alternative that I learned years ago in making templates for that hole was to take the, a thick needle, an embroidery needle. It needs to have a sharp point, but it wants to be, you want it to be the thickest needle you've got. And you could heat it up like using a candle flame. Don't burn yourself. Please don't burn yourself. Just get it hot. And then you should be able to punch using that sharp point of the needle to punch at that intersection. That might work for you too if you if you have to, if you can't find a hole punch. Um, and you could do it without the hole punch, but it is very nice having those um holes there so you can make the dots. And um, Sally's class, I can't recommend highly enough. One of the great advantages to being a star member of the Quilt Show is that although you're paying for a one-year membership, you have access to 15 years of fantastic shows. The other thing that has come up this week on the forum from a few people is, are we going to have more videos from Jen for this quilt? And the answer is no. She has provided all the information she wanted to provide in the show that it has aired and will continue to be available all year. And you're encouraged to watch that more than once. But she, you can find videos of her online. And I answered that question just the other day, and I put a link to um, two videos from 2019 that are lengthy that shows Jen. It's not this quilt, obviously, but she shows her techniques and she shows a lot of uh, things that apply to this quilt as well. And I think each of those videos is about an hour long. So you can find that link right there. All I did was Google Jen Kingwell videos and then start looking to see what I could find. But I put a link in the forum. Uh, so that's a tout again for the forum. There's so much information there that will help you to find this, uh, to get all the information you need. And I watch it constantly. I answer as quickly as possible. And so I encourage you to look at what's already been asked uh, and see, you may find the answer that you're looking for right away. And you can search the forum to also 
there's a search box and you can get um, that can help get you directed real quickly to where you want to go. But um, one of the great things about the hand piecing, a lot of people are trying this and I'm th this is interesting. I'm how many people on the forum are saying, hey, I'm trying hand piecing. I like it or I'm, I'm getting better. It's not something I've ever done before. Ginny Beyer is the queen of hand piecing and has been for years. She also no longer travels to teach or, or teach teaches really online at all. We have a great show with her. And it was, uh, we have a show, let me see where my numbers are. The um, 3008 was the master class. And there's a, a segment of Ginny showing her techniques for hand piecing. Every which, uh, all those parts which apply to this quilt, to the star block that we did in month one, to the blocks that we're doing this month and to future blocks coming along, how to join your sections, how to make sure those intersections are nice and tight. It's a great show to watch. It's the master class on piecing and it's show 3008. There's also a Ginny Byer show and I had the number, it's 601. That's in the old shows. So I had to go back to the, the old shows, but 601 where she was a featured teacher and a guest artist and she, it's great there. So all you have to do is go to the search engine on the, not the forum search engine, but the top of every page on the quilt show and just where it says search and you type in Ginny Byer. It's J-I-N-N-Y. B-E-Y-E-R, and everything we have, all the shows that she was involved with, we'll show you. We'll see that. So there's still a lot of great information out there. Of course, I think my blog has good information, but I don't know everything, and I certainly don't write about everything on the blog. And um, there's a lot of great information out there. So I encourage you to stick with The Quilt Show first because we have brought you fantastic teachers for 15 years and will continue to do that. Um, so I, I've learned so much here and I encourage you to take a look at that too. So, um, that's my pitch. Don't wait to start, start now. Okay. Um, I will also want to say one of the things I'm, I love to piece quilts and I have done that for many, many years. There's only three things we can do wrong in the piecing process, making a piece block, the cutting, the sewing and or the pressing. We want to master each of those three steps. So the cutting is going to start with an accurate template. And that's where the Sally Collins show 1602 comes in. And then once you've cut your pieces 100% accurately, now you have to sew accurately with a quarter inch seam. That's where the Ginny Buyer hand piecing uh, um, video will come in the show. And then the pressing. And we'll talk more about pressing too. So um, that's my pitch for what's out there. Uh, on our website that you can benefit from. You've already paid your $49. You should be learning these wonderful things that are that are on our site for you. Okay, let's. I'm going to switch now to the document camera so we can go through a lot of the information that I have for you today. Okay, document camera. There we go. All right, uh, that's my script. Got it. Okay. Well, the first thing I want to mention is again from the forum. The you know when you ask, sometimes you receive, and there were people asking about a coloring page, and I do electric quilt, but this would have taken me many many hours to try to put together. And fortunately, one of the members, star member Sheridan D, uh, who lives down under somewhere, uh, loves to play with electric quilt, and she put this together a coloring page. This is the um, this is the quilt pick a petal just done as a coloring page and if you're one of those people who has to plan your scrappy ultimately and i could see if you wanted to do this let's say in rainbow colors where you wanted the colors to blend in a certain way boy a coloring page would be really really helpful so um i got it from her we sent it on to mary Kay, who takes care of our website and we got it loaded for you right away and it's on our documents page for pick a petal so um uh, i was running out of ink and you can see mine's a little bit uh, wonky in color and I won't do anything with this other than keep it in my notes so anyway but there's that okay so a thank you to Sheridan for doing that there are also on the forum good visuals for templates Helen W in particular is really good at showing uh, with good pictures what she's talking about when she shows you how to do certain things so uh, do take time to look through the, the uh, forum uh, for all this great information that our other star members are putting together okay block one I like block one. I really do like block one. And I've made them before. It has a name that I could find in Barbara Brackman. It's called, I've seen it called several things, but glorified nine patch or improved nine patch is one of the, the names that you would see for it. And so 
here is one, this one I'm going to demo with, but here's one where I've got three of these petals sewn on, and I've got one more of this, oh, it's not a petal, it's a crescent. I have this last crescent to go, and then this block will be done. But the easiest way to make this, and, and if you've followed me at all for any length of time, you know that one of my mottos is, I want the fastest method that gives me the result I want. And the result I want is accurately pieced blocks. So, excuse me, take a sip of water. Okay, so the fastest way to make this block, and I've learned this years ago in making this block, was first to make a big nine patch. It's not an equal nine patch, it's an unequal nine patch. So I could cut out from, I decided, knew what the sizes were, and it's in the blog that I wrote this past Sunday that came up. It's the month two blog for block one. This is block one in month two. And so the only thing in here that's a square is the center, and then you've got the rectangles that go around the outside edge. And the, the square is one and three quarters finished. So that means you're cutting it two and a quarter with the seam allowance on either side. Then to attach to a square that's two and a quarter cut, we need strips that are rectangles that are two and a quarter by, and I had the measurement, so let me check. You know how you just go blank for just a second? The, yep, th I think three and a half. And it, it's in the blog, and I don't want to get up and check my book, but um, two and a quarter by three and a half. And then these squares, of course, are going to be three and a half cut size. Okay. So I just simply took four big squares, four small rectangles. Maybe it'll help again if I take this off at the bottom and you can just see the, so I've got four big squares, four rectangles, and a center block. Piece that together. I made the 20 of these in uh, just a few days while working on other things. It's a great leader ender project. And then I cut 80 of these crescents using the template. Now this is the acrylic template from the kit. Obviously, when you watch Sally Collins 1602 show, you will know how to make this yourself. If you were going to do this method for machine piecing, this would be the only template you would need for month two, this block. And it's a simple matter to make this out of your own template plastic. I know because I've already, I did one. And uh, I made a separate one of these, not including the seam allowance, and I'm going to show you what I'll do with that in a moment. So this would be the only template at all you would need for this month, for February month two, block one. So I cut 80 of these. I just went through the fabrics. Um, some of these are kit fabrics. Some of them are not. This one may not be. I know that this one is for sure. And I made 80 of those so that I was ready to go. Jen mentions that in her show. She, Most of us tend to cut the fabrics for one block at a time. And for her, who she loves to work scrappy, and obviously it's a very scrappy quilt, that's what she would cut a whole bunch of these units these different shapes. And then she when she was time to make a block, she just dug through those individual shapes and put the block together. We have a tendency today to be very, very matchy and think hard about fabric choice and all that kind of thing. Um, I would encourage you to try to get a little more uh, free about this with this particular quilt. If you're making it really scrappy, if you want it very planned, that's fine. But if you, especially if you've got the kit and you're using fabrics that are different than you might normally use, just don't agonize over each one too much. I wanted nine different fabrics. That's all that I was concerned about. Sometimes I had a light center. Sometimes I had a dark center. I just used them, and cut them out, and then said, okay, it's time to put this together. Which nine pieces of fabric do I want? Once they were sewn together, and I did, you just see this one, how I pressed this one. You can press whichever way makes sense. The I do all sometimes like to spin the seams, and so I did that on some of them as well. I'll have to see if I have one of those out to show you. Um, anyway, once I got that done, then I just selected four of these individual um, crescent shapes to decide which were going on the block. So I machine piece these quick, quick, quick. There's 20 of these. Took very little time to get those made. And then I wanted to hand applique at night these crescent shapes on there. So here's what I did. Okay, I did first. I made this seam um, template without the seam allowance, and I clearly wrote on there no seam allowance at the top. And as I have encouraged you all along, I made it 
And put it up here where you can see it. Okay. And I have pictures of this on the blog. I made it extra large. I've got about a half an inch extra down here beyond where the seam, the outside edge of this template is. Because in hand piecing in particular or machine piecing, I would I would say you don't have to sew to perfection if you can trim to perfection. And so I want extra fabric on the outside of my um, block in order to be able to trim it to perfection. So I made this. And then I took this template. Now, this is the G template. And um, the I just took it on each of my four intersections there. And the only, I wanted three dots. I want this dot, this dot, and this dot. Now, if you have, you've got the template issue, you don't have these acrylic templates, an alternative easy way is make this G template without the seam allowance, just again using template plastic and, you know, just plain old template plastic. Tr lay the template plastic on top of the pattern page once you verify you have the right size, that it's accurate, and just draw where the dots are and cut out on that line. And now you can lay it on here. You won't have the dot, but you won't need the dot because the your actual plastic is going to lay right on the seam allowance. I hope that makes sense. And then you just put a dot. I use this permanent pen so you could see it. I don't encourage you to use a permanent pen. Use a pencil or something that you know won't be um, if you don't actually cover it up. But I put a dot right here where the crescent is going to touch this seam allowance and right there and right down here in the, uh, yeah, the important point right there. Okay. And I use that. So if you have the templates, you can use that or you can make one for yourself without the seam allowance. Just mark it to yourself on there like I did. No seam allowance included. So you can draw those. Then, because I'm going to be hand applicating these at night and I like a line, so I simply took this template plastic that I had made without the seam allowance, and now I know right where to put these dots. And I use a mechanical pencil. This is my go-to marking tool on top of fabric whenever I can see it. And I simply held this nice and flat right there, and I traced that curve. That's all I did to get it prepped. Traced all four of them. One, two, all four sides. Okay. Then when it's time to sew, and I think this is the one I had planned to put there. We do overthink this, so I would encourage you, don't again, don't overthink it. Just cut four different ones and see where they want to go. I take these. Let me take this. You can maybe see this one better. Now I've got those dots, and I made the dots on the front side of the fabric. That's the reverse side. This is the front side. And I finger press just with my fingers, right there along the curve. It's a bias edge, so don't stretch it really big. Just do a simple little finger press. That's all it took to get it ready. Then I use four pins, and I go dot to dot. I put a pin, 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 okay? Then I'm going to start down there at the outside edge, and I want that pin, and I think you could, maybe you can just see it. I've got the black dot on this yellow square, and the black dot on the crescent, and I've lined those up, and I put a pin in there to get it ready to go. Now, I would put one more pin here because that's a pretty long curve, and I just I can see where it goes because I've drawn my pencil line, and I just put that in there as well, and then I hand applique that all the way around. When you get to the outside edge, okay, I've got my my needle is parked right here. I have a little bit of thread left. This is probably too short, so I probably would have cut that. But a lot of times I get to this outside edge and I've still got seven or eight inches of thread, so I'm ready to go. This piece is the next piece, and I do just what I just said. Switch all, you know, turn it under, get it, pin it in place, and get that ready. Now I'm going to take a few stitches out here in what is the seam allowance that connects this turquoise piece to this gray piece. And then I'm going to be as accurate as I can to make sure that that first stitch connects the two black dots, covers it up, and gets it right there. And then I stitch that all along. So what thread do I like? This thread, okay? These are the Quilter Select pre-wound bobbins. It's 80 weight. It is strong, it is fine, and there is every color here you could possibly need. The thing that is great about this thread is that it's, like I said, you can see it all the time. The thing that might sh you might struggle with is keeping the needle threaded. And so I'm gonna show you that. 
Okay, I'm going to try to show you that. The I learned this tip years and years ago from a wonderful hand applique teacher, Jane Townswick. At the time, I was doing all of my hand applique with silk thread for the most part, and this thread is very similar to silk in that it's that fine and that slippery. The problem would be you thread the needle and then you start taking stitches and the needle comes unthreaded. So the, the tip that I learned from, and it's, it's easier to see than it is to explain, is to put a little tiny knot at the eye. And so I'm right-handed, so I'm going to hold the needle in my right hand. I'm going to take the thread in my left hand and wrap it one time. I just do a twist right there. Okay. And when I showed this back some, maybe a year ago, someone else said she had learned it to do it over her needle, her nail. But I learned to do it over the pad of my index finger, so that's what I do. All right, so again, I go this way. I've just made an X right there. And now I'm going to put the needle, trying hard not to unthread it because I don't want to rethread it on camera. Okay. And I bring it under, under the thread toward myself. Come on. Let me see if I did it. Just the needle. And I want to see if you can come on now. All right, let's try that again. All right, there's nothing like live television uh, or videos to show you. Okay, loop around there, put the needle under the, the thread coming toward myself. Come on, try not to split the thread. All right, now I'm going to hold the needle straight up and down, and I'm going to hold the threads, and as I close it, I've made a tiny little knot right there. And I'm just pulling it up, and you can see that needle will not fall off. That needle is secure. You will have to cut the threads to get the needle off. That will save you tons of aggravation of having a needle come unthreaded all the time. So then all I need to do is set, put my knot at the end. Oops. So it's just a little wrap stitch. Watch it again and again. Try it. It's one of those tech um, skills that once you learn how to do it, you don't ever forget, like riding a bicycle. Um, but that's a great tip if you want to find that you have difficulty with these fine threads. Okay, so you get it all done. You've got your pieces on there, and you've got all four of them ready to go. And now it's time to trim. And I am going to give an alternative for um, machine piecing it. Uh, the crescents as well. But here's what you want to do now to get it the right size. Because of the fact that we've made these oversized, you need to be able to trim it to eight and a half inches. And so I mentioned early on months ago that an eight and a half inch square ruler was going to be your friend for this quilt. So eight, half of eight and a half is four and a quarter. So I'm going to want my four and a quarter in the center. And if I've done this right, I want these, and I'm not going to be able to sh probably show you the whole thing under the light, but I want you to see the important part. Yeah, slide you down a little more. Okay. All right. I've got this uh, pointer. <laughs> right here is the quarter, quarter inch. I want that spot to be right there on the diagonal. And the same thing over here on this side, which, of course, you can't see. Bring this up. Oh, come on. Let's see if we can get both of them in that. We can't. Yeah, and I'm not going to cut this on screen. That would be a disaster. But I get these in here. And I also want to make sure that it's straight. So I've got the diagonal line coming down here and on this side. And so this is a fiddle place. I will fiddle with this until I get this ruler completely accurately in line a quarter inch in, a quarter inch in, the diagonal here with a quarter inch there, and get this one in here. And I can move it around a little bit. I can tug on these fabrics a little bit to get them just right. When I know that I have it just right, and it's exactly right, I use my rotary cutter. Being right-handed, I cut up on this side and over on that side. I take it off the take the ruler off, turn the piece around 180 degrees, and fiddle again to get it back in there until it's exactly, accurately the right size. So um, that's when you're going to waste this little bit of extra fabric, but that's fine. Okay. The other thing that I do that I forgot to mention, and I do it before I do this trimming, okay, is I do remove these uh, this extra background fabric here, and it's really hard to see under the light. But you, remember, we've made this nine patch, 
And then we put another piece of fabric on top. So I take um, one of my, the wonderful Karen K. Buckley scissors that I like so much, and I carefully slide them in between and trim away, leaving a quarter of an inch seam allowance. And that, oh, that one hasn't been trimmed yet. All right, let me take one, let me grab one right off the wall and I'll show you. Okay. I finished this one the other day. Okay, so I have removed that excess fabric back there on all four of those before I do the, the cutting. All right, one other tip on this, and then we'll move on to the fan blocks. So you have some alternatives. If you, What if you don't want to um, hand applique, or you'd prefer to do machine applique? So you could do raw edge machine applique if you like. I really do prefer a turned edge, particularly on a quilt that I know I'm really going to love and want to keep because it just lasts longer. And so you can do a turned edge prepared, I call this, prepared applique, turned edge prepared applique. This happens to be print and piece fuse light, which is readily available lots of places, probably from thequiltshow.com, print and piece fuse light. And so the nice thing about print and piece fuse light is it's a lightweight stabilizer and it doesn't come out. You don't have to take it out. It will wash 90% out. It, it will leave a soft hand, no problem like that going forward. So that's an option. You could actually just draw these on the print and piece fuse light. You don't want the seam allowance included. So that again would take me back. I made cut that print and piece fuse light from this template with no seam allowance at the top because then I'm going to use just a light touch with glue, light touch with fabric glue stick, light touch and just turn it on under. One of my other favorite tools that I wasn't sure I really needed to spend the money to buy some years ago, but I use them all the time, so I do love them, are these Appliquick sticks, tools um, that are sold. The Quilt Show has them. Uh, Rosa Rojas has um, invented them. She's from Spain. This is the side that I use on this particular one. There's Two of these sticks and each end has a different type of a point. This one is a, a, just a beveled edge and it's perfect. Put a little light bit of, bead of glue there and I just use this and turn it and turn it and turn it as I'm going. There, there's a second stick and she uses both of them ambidextrously, but I can't use chopsticks, so I don't think I'd do very well with that. But, um, but anyway, but that's how I turn this under. And when this edge then is completely turned under, it's a nice smooth edge. I do the same thing I just talked about for where to place it get it in place, and then you could hand applique it or you could machine applique it. And these lightweight threads, the 80 weight quilt, quilter select stuff, would be great to applique. It's such a fine thread. I would just use a light one and just use it for all of the colors and not worry about it. Um, a, a sagey green works, a kind of a violety kind of color can work. They just grayish, a light gray, they disappear. So that's an option with print and piece fuse light. Another option is to do it out of freezer paper. Same thing, make the template with uh, freezer paper without the seam allowance, press it in place, put the waxy side on the wrong side of the fabric, glue the paper down, and then after it's sewn in place, you do have to take the paper out. All I do is spritz the back side of it with water, plain old water, and that will let the glue uh, give away, especially if you've used a light touch, like I said. The, the glue goes away and uh, it pull, you can pull that freezer paper out. If you don't use a heavy hand, you can actually pull the freezer paper out in one solid piece and use it again. So those are some suggestions for month two, block one, where you don't have to wait uh, if you are one of the, the folks that's waiting for the templates. But you do have to act this weekend. Don't forget. Okay, so that takes care of that. Now, the last month I mentioned... And I've got all the stuff here, so let me pull these around where I've got them back in place. I've got everything handy. And all right, so I mentioned last time that the fan blocks that we made in month one that went around the star, these little group of four fans, were the same size as those fan blocks that are used on the outside edge, the outside border of the quilt. And so that you could, if you needed something more to do, because every year with the block of the month, there's the speedy people who just are can't wait to do more and they want to get ahead. So um, that was something that you could do. And then I started getting a lot of questions from, from people wanting to, to know more about how to do this and trying to look at the picture and decide what they should be. So here's the thing to know about the fan blocks. And... The, all right, so in the border itself, remember Jen 
hand pieces, everything. So she made these, um, let me just fold this in half. She made 64 of these, and then she joined them in to be 32 of these. Well, several people could figure out that, you know, what if you made these, uh, put eight together, and then had one half circle instead of two quarters, because this shape, and again, I'll just show with the template so you can see, this C shape is half, of, it's a quarter circle. And um, then, or you could just join it. That eliminates a seam if you make a half circle. And that is true. The same thing would be true of this big background piece out here. If you cut this using the template, again, the um, you could do it where you don't have a seam right there and you have one big piece. So that's um, what I decided to do too. And I wrote on the blog that just came up today. Most of you haven't seen it yet because it just went out about two hours ago. And I show you, you got a wide variety of options. The quilt that Jen made because she's scrappy and loves scrappy. She, again, remember these are two four inch fans she would have sewn together. She has four different background fabrics here. These two handles are different fabrics from these two handles in that outside border that she put together. This one shows one of your options. I just use one fabric here and one fabric here. If you want your entire quilt to just have one fabric and one fabric, it'll take just about a yard, slightly maybe more than a yard, not much, an inch more than a yard, if you just want one background fabric out there. I calculated that so you would know, because somebody's going to ask. Okay, so, um, But what if you want to make them scrappier? So the same thing. We could still make these semicircles out of two fabrics instead of one, and we can make these background pieces again out of two fabrics instead of one. But I did find it so easy to make them just out of one that that's what I decided to do. And that's what I want to show you. So because I try to take my own advice and I said, well, I should be starting to work on these too. And so I made, um, you know, started to cut a bunch of these. There are 256 blades in that outside border. And for me, the most time consuming part of this whole process is tracing around the little blade template, drawing my little dots and cutting them out. So a friend of mine, um, student friend, Cindy, thank you, Cindy, for reminding me, said, you know, I'm just going to paper piece these things. And I went, oh, now that's a great idea. And so Cindy had put this together. She also likes to play with electric quilt. And so she had sent this to me and I went, man, that is really great. So then I dialed it up a little bit and gave you some information because we couldn't put a one inch um, block on here so you could check check your piecing. When you print these patterns, if you're going to paper piece them, they have to be accurate. You want to make sure that you have the right measurement. And so I've added this information on here. From this dot to this dot, finish size is two and a quarter inches. From the outside edge to the outside edge on this end, and of course up here too, because it's symmetrical, it would be two and three quarters, including the seam allowance, outside edge to outside edge. So that's there so that you can uh, find it and prove to yourself that it's correct. All right. So paper piecing, people either love it or hate it. One of the reasons people don't like it is that they have to tear off the paper. When I learned freezer paper foundation piecing, which we did with Color My World, the 2021 block of the month, I learned how to print and use the template, the paper foundations on freezer paper. And so that's what I did. This one is printed on freezer paper, and you can find this in plenty of places. A lot of quilt shops carry it, already cut in sheets that are eight and a half by 11. You can use regular freezer paper, but because it's on a roll, you may find that it curls. So then you just simply cut out a piece that's about eight and a half by 11, iron it quickly to your ironing surface, just that first time to get it flat, you know, not securely press it, just get it flat and then peel it up and trim it to eight and a half by 11 so it can go through your printer. You want the waxy side on the back side and you want the, the lettering on the matte side. And to get started with this, the first thing I did was just rough cut these pieces out. Once I have covered one completely, then it's going to get trimmed to the exact size. So, um, and I can see this has taken a lot of time, so I want to try to move this along. All right rest of these pieces here. So the great thing about doing this by paper piecing is how fast the cutting out process is. Instead of cutting out the little blades like I did here, I can cut rectangles. And this was super fast to make. You can see this is a stack of these rectangles. And you know how fast it was to cut them. And I think I cut them two and a half by three and a half. It says that in the blog. 
You might get by with it a little bit shorter, but with paper piecing, more fabric's better than too little. So I've just got a whole stack of them here that are ready to go for me to do the, the piecing. And so I've got those. Let me pull up the stack. I tried to put these in order. So we've got that. Okay. Come on down here. All right. All right. So the the first the first tip from Wendy Williams about using paper foundation freezer paper is before you do anything you pre-fold on every one of these lines and i get a sewing notion in the mail that i'll bet some of you get in the mail too they come from these credit card companies i don't know why i don't have whatever capital one whoever this is but i keep getting these in the mail and this is a handy dandy little sewing notion so you just simply put the line on, on along the sewing line and fold this back and then you fold this line and fold this line once you folded it, it the first time it's done okay the um great thing about that is you're not fiddling with it under the machine freezer paper paper piecing the real advantage is is twofold number one you don't sew through the paper so you use this over and over and over again so far i have made 30 of these little sets of four from two sheets two of these pieces is it i printed one sheet of paper that had three of these and I have used two of them to make 30 of these. So, and I, now the wax does give up. And when the wax is gone, I use a real simple little tiny dab of this disappearing Elmer's glue, school glue, you know, to hold it in place. You get your first two pieces in line. And I lay this where I can, I want you to be able to see this. Okay. So I have the first two pieces. You know how we sew wrong side. So, right sides together. So I put these first two on there and I lay them down and then I put the piece one and these are labeled. This is uh, one and I lay this here where I can see that I'm going to have a quarter inch seam allowance here and that this piece and the one under it are enough that are covering that rectangle completely. You can clearly see that I've got it covered. Then I'm ready to sew and this hasn't been sewn yet. It's just folded back and ready to sew. This one has been sewn. And what you want to see is your, the other advantage to this, as I said, it's twofold, that you don't sew through the paper and you don't lower your stitch length. If you're going to sew through paper, you really need to make that stitch length about a 1.75. You want to almost perforate the paper so that the paper comes out easily. The bigger, the longer the stitch, the more of a problem you're going to have with paper piecing where you're sewing through the paper. This one is, but the great thing about freezer paper is all that edge, the folded edge of the freezer paper does is provide a seam line, a, a sewing guide. Where am I going to sew? Right there. I want those stitches to run right along that fold, not through the fold, not away from the fold, right there. It takes a little practice to get to it, but you, you'll get it. And um, it doesn't take very long at all. Then, so it's a, it's a sew flip. Now I have to flip this part up. And so I go to my ironing surface and I use the dry iron. Whenever you're paper piecing, don't use water, steam in your iron. You want a dry iron. I fold this back along there. And in the beginning, the waxes, there's still plenty of this waxy coating on the back. So I don't need any other kind of glue. But this, as I said, has been used 15 to 20 times. And so then I just use just a tiny little dab of glue, just a little smear. I mean, a little, little bit. And I fold it up there like that. And now I'm ready to prepare this next edge. It's a sew, flip, trim. I want to trim this to get ready to add the next piece. So I'm going, I've sewn seam one, and now I'm gonna seam, sew the seam that joins two to three. And I'm gonna fold this back, and I'm gonna use the most wonderful tool of all, the add a quarter ruler, okay? And I use this postcard, my little sewing notion. If you have a pretty postcard, somebody mailed you in the mail, that's a nice thing to use too. And the Paper is folded back over the postcard. The piece that I want to trim is flat on the surface. And my add a quarter ruler is just right in there. It's just snug as could be. Now I'm going to use my rotary cutter. And this one's handy, so I'll use this. And I just come across there. Okay. This is trash. There's not a whole lot of use for that. Okay. And now I'm ready to add the next piece. You, you want to make sure, you, even if you're not using an add-a-quarter ruler, if you're using a regular ruler, you don't trim on the sewing line you just, or you just pull it off and start over again. We need that quarter inch seam allowance. Turn it over. And now I'm ready to pick up the next piece of fabric, whichever one it was. And it probably wasn't this one, but I'll grab this one. Okay. And I know where to put it. My quarter inch is right there. 
And so I can put it like that. Now, when we're dealing with angles like this, it can be very easy to not get this quite right. If you put this up here like this, and when you open it, you're not, you don't have enough fabric here to cover. If you put this way down here thinking, oh, I got to make sure I cover that. When you open it, oops, we don't have enough at the top. So the, that's why a larger piece is better than a smaller piece. But if you're not certain, here's the tip. Lay it in place where you believe that it should be. Turn it over and put a pin right there, a skinny pin, your, one of your finer pins on the sewing line, and then open it and check to make sure. It's a much easier to pull out that pin and shift things around than it is to have to unsew it to because you didn't have it on there to fit. So you just come across here, you do this one. It's a sew, flip, trim, sew, flip, trim. When you get it completely done, it looks like this. And because this one I've used before, it's already been trimmed. But the first time when it's still oversized with the paper, I use my square ruler and um, trim which core up here we go. Right there. Right. And I lay this out ready to trim away the excess fabric because you're going to still have excess fabric there. And I want to put the quarter inch line on the on the finished line. I'm not just trusting that the outside of the paper is in the right spot. I'm putting the quarter inch line right there and the quarter inch line right here and right there. And, and remember, I would have had excess fabric, so that's how I cut that away. I did find then that this curve was much too tight for me to really trim nicely with a rotary cutter, so I used scissors to trim it. And I tend to do the same thing with the scissors out here, but I've gotten a little bold in the last few of these doing it and actually use the rotary cutter to gently and carefully go around. If you start to cut away the paper, you've changed your um, paper pattern, so you need to be real careful not to do that. But here's the great thing about this freezer paper method. Once it's done, you just pull it off, and the as long as you haven't glued it too hard, um, this one's a little gluey, this one, he just comes off completely and it's ready to go. And I can use it over and over and over again. As I said, I've done many of these already. Okay, I'm gonna, I've really run along here. So all I wanna show you with the handles is how to, I did the same thing with this. You can either cut yourself up. I made this out of the template plastic and I just put the template plastic on the quarter circle and you were right here and then flipped it over and added the extra side. You don't want the seam allowance in the middle. So I did that. The part that's really neat is how to cut the backgrounds. And you were here. And the, uh, well, you were here. Okay. Um, hmm. Got a whole, I've got so many of these done that they're laying there. They, they, um, uh, oh, so I did sh figure out that once I got these done and I did the two of these together, that I really did prefer to make them as a group of eight. And then I made this the doubles here because I liked the doubles. And so I did that. And um, then I, so I hand appliqued some of these and I found that it wiggled on me and I tried to line it where it went. And once I started doing the prepping, and putting freezer paper on the back and turning it under, just like I was described how you would do with the, the crescent on block one, uh, then I said, you know what? There's no reason why I can't hand machine applique this or hand applique it, but glue it first. So I get this sewn together and then I put my little dots where I know that they go. I fold this in half so you know where the center is and I align the center and the two dots here. And I just put this light, light, again, light stitch of glue. And then I um, hand applique a few. And then I said, you know what, for speed, I'm gonna machine applique them. And again, I use the Quilter Select 80 weight thread for the machine applique. You can't see them at all. Some of these have been done. This one was done by machine. And I dare you to say that you can even see it. Uh, you can't, okay? So once this is then fully trimmed, the one thing I did wrong, because I didn't take my own advice when I was making the um, background fabric, I should have cut these rectangles five inches wide. And I blissfully zipped along and cut 32 of them at four and a half inches and said, oh no, when I got the last one cut, said, oh, if you had only cut them at five instead of four and a half, it would have been that much better. 
So anyway, um, this is running way long and I haven't shown you something else that I want to show you. So we're not going to do that now. I'll make another separate video and we'll get that added to the, the website of how to cut the, um, the fun little, this piece here from, if you want it without a seam allowance in the middle where you want to cut it in half. I know it's sitting here, but um, it'd take me too many minutes for it to find it. So I'm going to go back to the webcam and then I'm going to go look for some of the questions. I have loaded you with tons of information today. Alrighty, so I am going to, um, uh, while you're looking at, you're not going to, I'm going to look at the questions. You can see what's behind me. I do have the log cabin blocks made. They do not get sewn to the middle until way down the road. We're going to spend months five through 10 working on the embroidery and appliques. They, those log cabin blocks do not get sewn to the quilt until November, December. Okay, so let me go take a look and see if there's any questions. If I've given you too much information already and you're just bombarded. All right, let me go back to the beginning here. Uh, oh, come on. Oh, good. I see right. Okay. Do to do. Lots of people said hello. Finish. All right. Lots of people saying good morning, good morning, good morning, and where they're from. That's great. Um, cold. <laughs> Kathy finally gets to see me live. And there's Austin. I love Austin, Texas. I'm going to be in Austin in April. Um, how can you get the templates in Australia? Uh, you can't get them locally in Australia until next year. That's when the, um, they'll be available directly from Jen. And someone who's using them recommends using the templates. Okay, we've covered templates enough. Use a needle that was used to sew a turkey. <laughs> All right. So someone had a stiletto also. This is that punching a hole. I said, get a hot needle. So a turkey sewing needle. There you go. Turkey based needle. There you go. Um, yep. Another Sally Collins. Yes, you can draw on the freezer paper. Of course you can. Uh, okay. Sally Collins. She is awesome. Three and three quarters. Yeah. Okay. So that's what I said about the rectangles. Three and three quarters. And um, by and the squares, the two and two and three quarters. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, all of that is in the blog post that that's where I really can do the teaching part that I want to teach. Um, okay. Somebody's going to make the block there. Hey, Terry, good to see you. All right. Joanne's carries one sixteenth of an inch hole punches. Great. Thank you for that, Vicki. That's great. If you got access to a Joanne's, that's terrific. All righty. Is there written instructions on today's block? Yes. The blog that I wrote last and posted last Jan uh, Sunday, January, I want to say it was the 28th. Each month I do a blog with detailed pictures. Everything I showed you today is in words and written in my blog. Um, the links are there. Just go back. If you don't follow my blog, that would be a good thing to do. But if you just have to go look for it, it's it's all there, ever there. And then I have the new blog today that covers the fan blocks. Okay. Um, freezer paper, freezer paper, where do you get paper, paper piece templates? Not sure what that question is. When I freezer paper piece, I use an overcast foot. Ah, the blade runs right along. Sure. You probably have a great foot for your machine that might make that whole process of the machine applique, um, faster. Peg says she uses an overcast foot. I like the, um, open toe embroidery foot on my Bernina. Yep. Yep. Patrice did color my world. We did a lot of freezer paper, paper piecing, didn't we? And okay. Deb. Yeah, lots of people answering each other's questions. That's fantastic. Uh, the half circle blocks, yes, are when they are sewn together, those outside borders, they are four and a half high by eight and a half wide. Okay. Where do we, ah, good, good, Patrice asked the question, where do we find the background template for the fan? That is, um, has not been provided yet unless you have the, um, oh good, uh, somebody said that the template email is out. So I, I knew they were going to do that while we were here. So let me go back to where you can see me again. And I can see you sort of. Okay. Um, so the uh, email about the templates is out. So you've got to Sunday to order. The, the, the background shape. I'm, I'm going to talk to, um, my good buddies there at the, um, John and Alex, and we'll talk about this in another, it's not due to be released until November, 
but I think we can probably get you that shape. If, the people who have, they're talking about um, uh, the background. Here it is. Okay. The, this shape. Okay. Um, we don't have this one yet uh, on the paper, but um, this, this is the shape. But we have it in the pattern. So I think we're going to be able to get it to you much sooner than that. So you can actually start making them complete. There are 64 individual fan blocks in the border or 32 doubles, which go together. You don't have to make them all in the first month. So, and this is running really, really long, but um, anyway, it's, you can take your time on this stuff as we get time and work along them. So um, I just uh, encourage you to order the templates if you want them watch Sally's show 1602 and start making some of your own templates so you're ready to go and uh, get started just because this is a great quilt and it's one that next month we show the next block and there are 20 of those the month after that we make the log cabin blocks and there are 20 of those in the entire quilt so once you've got um we get this these first couple of months under our belt, as far as instruction is concerned, you have the rest of the year to get them made. So don't worry. Uh, it's all going to happen uh, and it's all going to come together. And I think whether you're learning to hand piece or you're converting some of these hand piecing ideas to machine piecing, whatever, every one of these blocks of the month should, should teach you something. Um, and maybe what it teaches you is I don't want to do this again. But it, it is something that um, you'll learn. And, and every school, skill that you put in your toolbox is a skill that you can carry forward. Anyway, so tons of stuff, way too much information. I will get another little video made up here in another few days about uh, cutting that um, this shape. If you want to cut it on a fold, it's on the blog that went up today. But um, anyway, so thanks a lot. Till uh, it's a wrap.